Uh, so welcome back, everyone. Um, it uh, was uh, good to see you all again this morning and looking forward to a uh, final packed day of um, curriculum um, in addition to starting the final push for the uh, incubator projects. Um, those incubator projects will be running through tomorrow um, and we'll take advantage of the full day tomorrow to to advance them, um, but hopefully uh, start that push today. Uh, but prior to that, we have a uh, broad, if nothing else, and intense, broad and intense uh, set of materials that uh, we need to cover. And these include a lot of um, key remaining elements of curriculum. Um, these elements have been triaged um, in light of the remaining time and in light of expressed interest yesterday, um, particularly on the GIS front. Yeah. And this is going to necessitate some quick coverage of material that could otherwise readily occupy in this boot camp alone a couple hours um, on particular topics, but we're gonna have to go through them quickly. By request, it does include some substantial GIS coverage, and we'll be getting hands-on experience with GIS functionality and agent-based modeling. We'll be talking about where it fits in, why it's so important for certain classes of models. And we'll further be talking about how it's realized using uh, the particular platform um, we're working with, AnyLogic. Um, so we'll be getting hands-on experience in AnyLogic's GIS components uh, with a uh, kind of fun example. Santa was working late last night. Um, so uh, that will occupy the first part of uh, today. We'll also be covering an absolutely central element of uh, virtually any modeling project. Uh, one that's really important for scientific validity and robustness, uh, as well as insight and understanding, and that's sensitivity analysis. We're gonna be playing, talking about some of the special roles that sensitivity analysis plays in the agent mix context, um, where we not only have needs to assess model sensitivity parameter assumptions, which extends across all the modeling, major system science modeling traditions, but also the need to be able to understand uh, sensitivity with respect to stochastics, which as we've seen from example to example, play a big role in adding texture data-based modeling and allowing it to capture variability, but also requiring us typically to run a model many times to get reliable insights, to get to capture, to be sure we're capturing the regularities of the model and not flukes, not chance events that are simply the product of happenstance. So we're going to be uh, examining sensitive analysis. We'll go on to examine a different process that also adjusts parameter values and runs the model many times in the pro in the process also deals with, at some level, with uncertainty, and is also drawing our attention to model outcomes and how they vary with parameter values. And that's calibration. The goal of calibration is to, using a model, best adjust the assumptions about that model to match empirical data. 
particularly data that's emergent from the model. From this floor, on the second day of this event, this boot camp, I discussed the threefold division that it's good to bring to a model to understand how the model, the, the stance the model takes with respect to different factors um, in the that, that might be envisioned in the real world situation. So if we have a model of some real world situation, is the given quantity a given factor, a given element or component of the real world system represented endogenously, exogenously, or ignored? And for endogenous things, there's the very quite likelihood that the model will give rise to interesting emergent patterns for it. And, and really, calibration is about taking a very large bulk of data we have in the world, which relates to factors that are emergent from the model. We can't tell that data, make this happen in the model directly. The model's producing it, it's generating it. But we can adjust our assumptions in the model, our assumptions about parameters, or even about model structure, so that it best reproduces that data we see from the world. And so while a, a large amount of data may go into parameters, a larger often amount of data goes into keeping the model honest, um, sort of uh, making sure the model reproduces emergent patterns we see from the world. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the process of calibration. And that will occupy a significant chunk of our days because it has extra text, particularly in the context of, of HMS modeling, where we can gather information about many types of things. Spatial patterns, patterns over networks, patterns of history of individuals, longitudinal statistics on individuals, as well as cross-sectional data of a sort we might have from an aggregate system dynamics model. All these are at play with HMAS model, and we also have stochastics that have to be contended with when calibrating. So calibration is extra texture and extra cost associated with it in HMAS. Now, beyond that, we're going to be talking about hybrid modeling. And if there's one topic today that's most emblematic of the future of modeling, of the dawning of a new frontier, it's hybrid modeling. Hybrid modeling is not entirely new. We really contributed substantive hybrid modeling for, for insight back, back to the opening decade of the 2000s. But um, but it's routinized use, its ability to add nimbleness to model, to change model, not just model assumptions, not just model structure, but the language we use to describe model, the language of system dynamics, stocks and flows, or the language of discrete event simulation, or the language of agent-based modeling, um, the ability to change that nimbly is a newer feature in the modeling landscape. And it adds great power in the context of the sort of learning that takes place during modeling. Modeling is learning. Modeling is rightly viewed as a form of learning, computer-assisted learning, computationally-assisted learning. And as we learn, we modify our assumptions, we modify our model structure, our parameter assumptions, but we also modify the language we use to describe the model, shifting perhaps what parts are articulated with an agent-based formulation, 
instead of a system dynamics stock and flow formulation, zooming in as it were in certain parts of the model. Or another case, introducing discrete event simulation to capture workflows. And it's this ability to take advantage of metalinguistic abstraction, choosing the language we use to describe phenomena in the world, and nimbly changing what language we use to describe different features of a real world situation, changing the boundaries for what's described with stock and flow, what's described with, with agent-based modeling, what's described with discrete event simulation. That's really a quite new phenomenon to be able to change that nimbly. And it's something that's arguably the foremost feature recommended by anyone. Um, it's in fact the very impetus for the name of any logic, any logic. It's the ability to capture uh, phenomena, describe phenomena, characterize phenomena using different languages, different types of logic. So, He's spending much of the afternoon talking about metalinguistic abstraction, going through example after example of models which have taken advantage of that metalinguistic abstraction, um, which have taken advantage of different elements created in different languages and melded them together. And what we'll see is in the current modeling landscape, in the contemporary landscape of use of of modeling tools, hybrid modeling is not merely a luxury. It's not merely a nicety for a niche set of cases. It, it's starting to be, if not a ubiquitous need, a, a very prominent need to weave together pair individuals' uh, underlying health situation with service seeking and delivery on service pathways to, to be able to deliver together a rather high level view of the general population and a zoomed in view of a focal group or one or more vulnerable populations of greatest interest. The ability to weave together a theory-based description of an agent's evolution articulated with stocks and flows within an agent. Um, with, so agent elements of agent dynamics, continuous agent dynamics capture with stocks and flows. All these are but three examples of, of hybrid modeling. And hybrid modeling is quite straightforward in any logic, but carries some significant performance uh, trade-offs that one has to be, of, of which one has to be aware and um, that require consideration and, and prominence for, for some of the cases. So we'll be talking about that. And as time allows, we will further talk about some additional loose ends. Agents that are born or immigrate into a model. We have seen it open populations in the form of agents dying or disappearing, but we're going to see how to bring them into the model. We'll see how to export data, data exported to files, data exported to spreadsheets or databases, et cetera. We'll see how, the, how all this can be done readily uh, within any logic. Uh, and there's some additional, additional components as well such as hierarchical modeling, we might have time to touch on, but which are, which, which, which are cognate to close cousins of and enablers of hybrid modeling as well. Cases where we have um, uh, a hierarchy of, of agents in a model and some of them may be described with one approach, system science approach or another. Now, yesterday, we work through a set of examples. Now, these examples at a at their most elemental level, their most obvious level, most patent level, were about mobility in a population. 
But I weaved into that by choice, by design, a set of additional elements. I wove in elements associated with hierarchical state charts. I wove in some discussion of taking the sort of data that might come from a survival analysis, might come from a competing risks analysis, might come from a, some sort of regression type approach. In some cases, uh, logistic regression, and actually incorporating a, a formula within the agent-based model that can leverage that sort of information. We also saw how mobility among venues could be used to understand where in an agent's life cycle certain effects are being felt, um, where, for example, they were getting triggered with their asthma. I also introduced some, some reasoning, um, some clever uses of hierarchical modeling um, to capture certain features in a more elegant, uh, more elegant fashion and capturing interacting state charts. So, so there's a bigger story there that we saw to weave to together. And um, I was pleased to see some of the elements of what we have covered in recent days starting to make their way into some of the projects yesterday. That was really good to see. So we have a full day today and I don't wanna lose any more time, but as always, the priority is in questions from you, is in addressing your needs and priorities. So I'd like to start with any 